Good evening and welcome to this community forum on homelessness. My name is Dick Beal. I'm a resident of Walnut Creek. I'm co-facilitator of this task force with my colleague Jenny Creheda. Also, my co-moderator tonight is John Heathcock, and he will be taking over at the end of the, of the panel presentations, and he'll be handling the question and answer session. <clears throat> Before we start with the uh, panel discussion, I'd like to share about the task force. This, the first slide is to tell you a little, about, a little bit about the task force. And it it, it uh, shows our mission statement, the short version, is we want to research and identify best promising and emerging practices for short-term memory remedies and to help our help the homeless now and long-term solutions to cure the causes of homelessness slide two presents our mission statement and a short version of that is a time is our vision, a time when all members of our community have safe, suitable housing. S slide three shows a number of the projects that the task force has considered. The uh, task force was begun in the fall of 2013, and it, it work has been to glean from other cities several projects that might be viable in Walnut Creek. We are now prioritizing these and developing the next step. We invite you to join us as part of the uh, task force. We meet every third Wednesday at 2 p.m. Our contact information is on the flyer that's on the chair that you're sitting in. Tonight we have the privilege of, rep of presenting to you these, the panel, who form the front line in the struggle with homeless issues. They're going to tell you what they're doing about these issues. We have representations from, representatives from the county, the city, and homeless services who will speak about homelessness and what we're doing collaboratively to help people experiencing homelessness. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a time for question and answers. You each got a card on the chair in front of you or that you're sitting in, and we ask that you write your questions on those as they may occur to you during the evening. When you have a, have a written question, please raise it up and one of us will come around and, and collect it. Uh, we ask, number one, that the question be written legibly. <coughs> At this time, I'd like to introduce the Walnut Creek Mayor, Justin Waddell, and turn the proceedings over to the panel so that uh, they can make their presentations. Good evening. Uh, yes, my name is Justin Waddell. I have the pleasure and honor of being or serving as mayor for the city of Walnut Creek this year. And thank you for, for being here tonight. It's, uh, it's exciting to see such a large crowd because it shows that, number one, we have a very engaged community, but also it shows the importance of this issue in our community. And the City Council also believes this is a very important issue, so much so that we made it one of our top four priorities. Now, every two years, the City Council gets together and we decide what major policy items we want to focus on. And, for the past few, two, uh, little over a year, a year and a half, we focused on these four issues. Uh, the, uh, our infrastructure, of course, our updating our economic development plan, but there's two issues that we believe are just as important, and they both tie together at the hip. The affordability and availability of housing, of course, as anyone in this room that uh, I'm sure lives in this area knows, it's very expensive to live in this area, and it's hard for individuals, number one, to buy a house, or it's even more difficult for those individuals that, that are renting. We are, uh, we are spending a lot of time and focusing on improving our, our development process and ensuring that we can get more development going on in our community in hopes of leveling out the, the rent increases that we've seen over the past few years. The last thing is, uh, and I'm actually very proud about this, 
the, the city council has focused on real, uh, realistic responses to homelessness. And that's the reason why, part of the reason why we're here tonight. So how are we gonna do that? We're focusing on three areas. First, of course, community partnerships. It's not only through organizations like the county, but it's also through organizations like where, why we're here tonight, the Trinity Center and the, the Homeless Forum. We're also reaching out to, uh, through community engagement. Uh, those of you that, have, that attend or pay attention to the city council, you'll know that we talk about this a lot at the council level. We have outreach programs like this, this forum and also the, the nutshell, the, the, uh, the, the city's website. There's lots of information out there for anyone that, any individual that wants to know what's going on in the city. And then of course, how you can actively participate in hopefully solving this problem. Our outreach and education campaign, uh, as I said, is uh, through multifaceted uh, mechanisms. First, of course, you can go online. Uh, we also have a lot of community presentations that we've uh, done at organizations like this, and of course, in at the city council level. We are uh, working very diligently to subsidize low-income housing. One of the, the benefits of our inclusionary housing program, and of course, all the development that is going on in the city, is that we have a, 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 a depth of funds that we can utilize in order to work with our community partners to ensure that low-income housing occurs here in Walnut Creek. The last time I check, and Margo will be able to check me on this, uh, we, we've, in the last eight years, I think it's been a, approximately $20 million that we've been able to utilize with our community partners to develop low-income housing. I have that number, right? Uh, the number's right, it's more like 12 years. Back 12 years, well, eight years is better, but 12 <laughs> years is fine. Uh, that's a lot of money. One of the benefits that we are seeing as a community because of the, the at market rate development that is going on in the city. We've also worked to incentivize uh, the development of low-income housing through uh, other ordinances that we have that allow for additional density, which of course well, not only provides uh, low-income housing on, uh, opportunities uh, on um, at market rate uh, uh, properties. So it's uh, it's great to be here tonight to talk about this all-important issue and work with our and discuss this uh, this issue not only with you but also the community partners that we have here in Walnut Creek. Thank you for being here tonight, and I'll pass it over to the county. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Jeanette, and I'm with Health, Housing, and Homeless Services for the county. Um, and I am the person that sends out lots of emails about lots of meetings. So if you've wondered who that is, that's me. Um, I'm going to talk. My job is really um, sort of to hang out at 30,000 feet and keep an eye on what's happening in the whole homeless system for the whole county. Um, and also, I say my job is kind of herding cats, right? Bringing a bunch of different kinds of partners together and making sure they meet each other and are all kind of moving in the same direction. Um, so I'm going to talk about data kind of at the 30,000 foot perspective. Um, so you can see, can't see it on here very well, but um, this just gives you a little snapshot about what we can tell about Contra Costa County. One of the things that I didn't really realize, I worked in this county for about 12 years, our county geographically is almost the size of the state of Rhode Island. Right. And it's extremely diverse. We have some of the wealthiest and some of the lowest income populations. We have urban, we have rural, we have suburban. We have real mix. We also have 19 jurisdictions, right? We have 19 different city councils and town councils that all have different thoughts and feelings and ideas. So getting everyone kind of to move in the same direction is sometimes hard, um, especially when we have pressing challenges like this. So you can see we need about 30,000 housing units in this county just to meet the needs for the low and extremely low income communities. That's not counting, just like middle class folks trying to squeak by. Um, there's a lot of need in our community. We have about 48% of the shelter capacity we need. And I say that because we don't have enough resource in our community to meet the needs of everybody that has housing needs and that needs homeless services. Um, and uh, the backdrop for that is we've done a lot of changes to our system of care about um, how people come in. We've made it a lot easier, but we've also changed how people get prioritized for care so that the most vulnerable people are actually getting access to services first. And we have a like systematic way of doing that with an assessment and everything. But just to paint the picture that there really is a stark need in this community. We're no different than any other Bay Area community. Frankly, this is an issue for all of the Bay Area, all of California, even the entire West Coast is really struggling with the same issues that we're struggling with. 
Um, all of our homeless providers in the community, um, not every single one, but almost all of them contribute data. When somebody comes in to access services, they enter data in and say, so-and-so came to visit, and this is what they needed, and this is sort of their demographics, and here's, here's what they got. So this is just a snapshot for last year of how many people we served and kind of what that population looks like. So you can see we have about 6,000 people, individual people, that accessed homeless services in this county last year. About another 1,000 are at risk. So maybe they're doubled up, they're couch surfing, they might not be literally homeless, but they're pretty close. And about another 1,000 people that are actually in homeless housing programs. So that um, formerly homeless or people that are in like our permanent supportive housing. Um, they are still getting case management and, and rental assistance, um, but they are all, they're formerly homeless. So just to give like a snapshot picture. You can also see um, we have about 640 families with children that accessed homeless services. That does not mean that there are only 640 families in the county that need homeless services or that are experiencing homelessness. Um, families with children and folks that are undocumented tend to not access services as often because they're afraid, right? So that's actually probably somewhat of an undercount. Um, you can see we have about 400 something veterans. Um, and that's regardless of discharge status, basically if they've been in the military, regardless of whether they actively served or, or how they were discharged, they get counted as a veteran. Um, and the um, disabling conditions piece, that's all self-reported. So those numbers are actually probably lower than reality. Um, but you can just kind of get a general feel for um, what's going on with our population in the county. Finally, I just wanted to show you, so one of the ways we gather data is not super accurate, but it does let us capture data year to year. So who's ever heard of the homeless point in time count or participated? Excellent, love it. So this is like we take one snapshot in time, the federal government says, hey, everybody that gets federal money for homelessness, you gotta do this. They say every other year and we actually do it every year. But they say go out and pick whatever night you want the last 10 days in January, <clears throat> And you get a snapshot on one night, you find everyone you can possibly find that was homeless that night. So we look at who is in our shelters, who's in our programs. We also have our core outreach teams, which we'll talk about in a minute, that go out into encampments. We have people at service sites. Um, so we know this does not capture everyone that's homeless in our community. But what it does allow us to do is year to year, because we're using basically the same method and looking in basically the same areas, you can kind of see the trends. Um, so, um, oh, this slide is different than what's showing here. Oh no, it's the same, sorry. Um, I can't see very well on this screen. So at the top you see overall the county trend. Um, that's like the, for the whole county. And then the bottom numbers you see um, in Walnut Creek. So sheltered in Walnut Creek, so Trinity Center has shelter here in Walnut Creek. Um, and then the unsheltered is the green. So you can just kind of see the trends um, over the years. And again, it's not the most accurate data, but it's the data that we have for that one night in January that we looked. And with that, I'll turn it over to Margo. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about a very specific aspect, um, which it has to do with affordable housing. So this is this is um, this represents part of the problem, it's part of the cause, um, and it's also part of the solution. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's happening currently and what the city of Walnut Creek is doing um, um, as it relates to affordable housing. And I work for the city of Walnut Creek, I'm the housing program manager. So this first slide is really just to kind of show like we're not alone in this crisis. So. I think everyone knows the housing crisis is happening. We have it, we are experiencing it regionally for sure in the Bay Area. We're also experiencing it throughout California. And this is a map that shows um, the entire country. And um, I, I can't, hopefully it shows well enough up there with the different colors, but this shows how many hours you would have to work um, at minimum wage in the different states to be able to afford um, housing in that state and so the darker color the more hours it is and so I don't know if you can see on that slide I, I can't see on this one but for California it's 90 the average is 92 hours a week um, at minimum wage to be able to afford um, to live here 
And so this next slide just sort of drills down a little further. So we have California and Contra Costa County. Um, the average would be about 126 hours a week. And in Walnut Creek, it would be 148 hours a week. And this is to be able to afford a one bedroom. So it's like a single person household working and living. Um, this here shows, this slide shows for California, I have a similar slide, I didn't put it in for the Bay Area that pretty much mirrors this. And this shows employment um, growth in California versus housing growth. And, it, and you can see it for the past, um, I don't know, six or seven years. So the blue line is the employment growth, the number of new jobs. Um, and those are actually in the hundreds of thousands on the side. Um, you can see those are the new jobs. And then the orange bar is the new um, housing permits during those same time periods. And you can, so you can see how the problem is going to get compound over time with the high housing cost um, because of supply and demand. This slide shows um, just housing permits issued. This is throughout California. And you can see. Um, Starting in about 2007, you can see the projected housing need at that time was about 180,000 new homes annually, and the, the um, permits issued really dropped down. And so we started to, the supply that started to not meet the demand starting back in 2007, and we haven't recovered, and in fact, it's compounded the issue. So now we're very behind in meeting the demand. So the city of Walnut Creek, just to highlight a few things, and this will be ech echoing some of what the mayor said, what, what things are we doing to try to help? Um, and of course, obviously the city council making it a priority, the, the supply, the availability and affordability of housing is a big piece. We also have a lot of different housing policies. Um, planning policies and things that are being implemented to help. We have lots of information on that on our website. And so I want to encourage people to go there or to contact me if you want more information, because I, I won't be able to get into it all tonight. But um, one of the big things we do is we subsidize um, affordable housing. So 100% affordable projects. We're able to subsidize that with um, fee payments that market rate developers have paid that is specifically to develop affordable housing. We also have some other special funds that allow us to do it. And we do it in partnership with the nonprofit developers um, and in partnership with lots of other programs that are we are able to leverage our money to get affordable projects going. We do have a very um, important project moving forward right now. Um, and are you going to be talking about that in your presentation, St. Paul's Commons? OK, so I'll let Donna address that in her presentation. Um, we're also looking to how can we better and more effectively incentivize affordable housing development. So how can we encourage market rate developers to include affordable housing in their projects? We do have some local requirements related to that, but how can we actually encourage them to voluntarily provide more? What can we do in exchange? So we're looking at that. Um, how, do, how can we incentivize it? And one piece of that is streamlining development. So streamlining development is both something we can use to incentivize affordable housing. It's also something we can do to help get housing, all housing, all levels of housing, market rate um, and affordable, built quicker. Um, and then, of course, we have a very um, big outreach and education campaign right now in the city. And so I did bring some handouts if anybody's interested with information about upcoming projects and diff different things that are happening. But I encourage you to come to our website um, because we do post information about up upcoming events and lots of new data and things. And we are doing presentations periodically throughout the city. And now I'm going to hand it over to Donna Colombo. Thank you. So thanks for coming tonight. I'm Donna Colombo. I am the executive director of Trinity Center. Six years ago, I discovered that we, there was a homeless population in Walnut Creek. I didn't know about it before that time. I also discovered that there was an organization in Walnut Creek that had been operating for about 15 years working with homeless, those at risk of being homeless, and, and with the city. That organization closed in the fall of 2012. It was called Fresh Start. And St. Paul's, the church that I attend, asked if I might, I had just by, retired, by the way, 
and um, might, might go and see if it was something we could continue as a, as a faith community. So we started Trinity Center. We began conducting by, by conducting research. So why are so many people homeless and why here in this seemingly affluent community? And then developed a vision for how we might help people move beyond homelessness and poverty. So we started, we had three main goals when we started. Um, the first one was safety net services. We wanted to be able to provide food, clothing, showers, laundry, all the things that you need and every one of us take it, uh, for granted maybe. Two, assistance with overcoming the causes of being homeless. Uh, in the, and so today our program continues with all of the things that you see on the screen to help meet the needs of the people living without housing, those at risk of losing their housing. We are one of three Contra Costa County care centers. Our third goal was housing, and that started from 2012. It was, has always been about housing, because without housing, you will always have people living without housing. So um, what we've been able to do over the past five and a half years is to be able to provide a winter shelter. That's emergency shelter, but it is housing for a period of time. Mid-2019, St. Paul's Commons will open with 44 units of very affordable housing. I'm pleased to say that about half these units will be for special needs residents. This is a project with St. Paul's Episcopal Church, the City of Walnut Creek, Resources for Community Development, our developer, Contra Costa County and Trinity Center. It takes a lot of people to be able to do this and do it well, and the community that supports this effort. Trinity Center will continue to operate and provide services on the first floor. Our new center will have more space to engage one-on-one -on -one with our members and add physical and behavioral health services. We want to be, have those services meet the people where they are. We're very excited that our vision for a community center to help people in need and affordable housing will be a reality very soon. We break ground on um, May 16th. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Um, Michael Fisher, I'm with Health Housing Homeless Services with the county and I oversee direct operations with the core homeless outreach team. So prior to 2017, uh, we had one outreach worker who was covering the whole county of Contra Costa County. He was coming from a law enforcement approach and um, he worked really well with the cities, but with the amount of homeless that we have in Contra Costa County, it just wasn't cutting it. So now we have six teams, six teams in operation. Um, that are covering all of Contra Costa County, but one of those teams is dedicated directly to the city of Walnut Creek 20 hours per week. Um, the city of Walnut Creek has been really good at um, being on the forefront of homelessness and partnering with whoever they can partner with to make sure that they can make a difference for the homeless. So what does CORE do? So work, CORE works in direct collaboration with the police department. Um, as soon as they come on duty, uh, they check in with the dispatch for Walnut Creek. Um, at that point, they're dispatched out to calls involving homeless individuals that are living in the community. Um, as we know, homelessness is not a crime. Um, so we try to free up the officers as much as we can to deal with criminal matters. And then we uh, surround the homeless individuals with services and try to get them more supports. So we have, a, we have many partnerships, one of which is the Trinity Center. Uh, we work in collaboration with Trinity to provide the best services we can uh, to homeless individuals living in Walnut Creek. Um, we have developed relationships with Healthcare for the Homeless, which is the county's healthcare system. Um, two days per week, uh, our teams go out with Healthcare for the Homeless. They're providing street medicine, uh, psychiatric injections, um, any type of medication uh, that somebody may need, and then also connecting people with primary care physicians to help them with their health and their mental health stability. Um, 
CORE also sits on the Walnut Creek Homeless Task Force every month. Um, we stay up to date on homeless issues that Walnut Creek is currently facing, and we try to stay on the forefront of, that, uh, of those issues. So prior to 2017, there were many access points into homeless services. There were, you had to call a 1-800 number once a week um, at a certain time on a certain day in order to stay on a shelter bed list and many of you know that homeless individuals do not have cell phones, they don't have a way to keep track of their day, they don't have a way to do any of that. And then all the service pro providers were operating under different umbrellas. So you would call sheltering for sheltering services, grip for grip services. Um, so we found that there's a big issue there. Um, we came together as a county and as a, a, a system and we developed three easy uh, entry points into our system. Um, Anybody can call 211 for free, be connected directly to one of our core outreach teams um, or crisis line or anything else that they need in our, in our, in our county. Um, another way to get into our services is a brick and mortar, um, a brick and mortar site, uh, such as the Trinity Center, uh, the Monument Crisis Center, the Concord Care Center, um, any of these sites that we have throughout the county. So you can go to one of those centers, you can get housing support, you can get mental health support, alcohol and other drug support, you can get all of that. And then the last one is through our core teams. So we gave our core teams direct access to all of our county shelter beds, which I currently operate 214. Um, so at any given time, if somebody in Walnut Creek needs a, a place um, as, a, as a shelter, um, the core team can place them directly into the shelter and there they can stay for 120 days with comprehensive case management services. Um, we're also finding about 37% of the people who go through our shelters are going into housing which in this housing market is incredible. So what have we learned? As Margot touched on, the housing market is, is a crazy. Um, and I would like to touch on some numbers so you guys can get an idea of what we're working with. In the month of January, our core team served 28 people living in the city of Walnut Creek. In February, it was 40, and in March, it was 39. Of those people that we serve, 90% made less than $1,000 per month. Um, with the cost of housing being as high as it is, that's not even enough to rent a room. So what are we doing about it? We're building relationships with people. We're placing people in multiple shared rooms. We're doing whatever we can to think outside of the box to make sure that people have the right and, and can restore dignity and get into housing. 88% um, of the people that we touched in Walnut Creek are living in places not meant for habitation. That means vehicles, um, parks, creeks, wherever they can lay their head. Um, we're starting to see a trend of elderly folks, um, extremely vulnerable elderly folks. As, as a matter of fact, we have people who are in their 90s who are currently living in our shelters. Um, and, and most of them are not because they're using drugs or mentally ill, it's because the, the people they were renting from raised the rent and now they're homeless. So they're coming, they are cohabitating with individuals who have been homeless for long periods of time. 50% um, of the people that we touch lost their housing in Walnut Creek or the city of Concord. So they're all right here in your neighborhood. It's not people coming from outside. Um, and, and we're finding the common reason that people are here in Walnut Creek uh, is because their family and friends live here. Or this is where they grew up. It's all they know. This is where they want to live. So even though they can't afford to live in housing, they, they still want to live where they know. This is where everybody knows their name. So just some results. We placed 12 people of those people that we served in the last three months directly into shelters. We connected 27 into a warming center where they can stay every night to stay warm. And 14 were connected to local care centers where they're being provided comprehensive services. Um, the main thing that we've learned is it takes partnerships. It's not as simple as placing somebody into a shelter. It's um, really intervening in a critical time in their life and, and giving them hope, restoring them back to society and doing whatever it takes. So that's what we're doing here at CORE and that's all I have. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I know a lot of you had long days, uh, but we are always looking for ways to share information, to educate, to answer questions, and a forum like this is just the perfect opportunity to do that. 
Uh, I know many of you have lots of questions. We're here to answer those the best we can. Um, Lieutenant Conley, I work with the Walnut Creek Police Department, been in law enforcement for over 22 years, been working with the homeless uh, for about the last 13 years. Uh, and through the trend, as we kind of progress through um, dealing and managing the homeless population and in managing homelessness in Walnut Creek, it always fell on the police department. Well, what's the police department doing about this situation? Um, many, many calls would come in from community members about that. What are, what are you guys doing to address this? And there's some things that the police department can address and there's some things the police department can't address. And that's where these partnerships are in, important with Trinity Center, with our core teams. Uh, in the last uh, five years, we've made uh, tremendous steps in managing our uh, homelessness in Walnut Creek. Uh, is it something that we can solve? If we could get everybody into permanent housing, we would solve this problem. Um, but the reality is it's, it's very hard in Walnut Creek to find permanent housing. So we have to find a way to manage it. And uh, just having dialogue partnerships is the best way to do that. Uh, the core teams that we have out in, in our city right now, we do share that core team with the city of Concord. It is a partnership that we have. So that was another way. So when an officer comes out and um, encounters someone who is um, struggling with homelessness and there isn't a crime being committed, uh, there isn't anything that we can do, there's maybe some mental health issues, there's some sub substance abuse issues, that's where our core teams come in. And that's where Mike and those partnerships and our, also our partnerships with the Trinity Center for those types of services really help us out as police officers. Uh, our officers are out there daily. We know a lot of our homeless population by name. Uh, we know a, a lot of their stories. There is a story behind every individual out on our streets. Um, maybe they want to be homeless, maybe they don't want to be homeless, um, but everyone has a story, everyone has a struggle, and it's our job as police officers to figure out what those struggles are to get them into services if they want to take services. Unfortunately, there's some individuals out there that don't want services. They choose to be homeless, that's what they like to do, and they, they don't want to take advantage of services, but those that want to take advantage of services, we're getting them in. And the officers ask those questions, do you need services, what do you need, and that's where our core team comes in. So from my perspective, in the last 13 years, um, Walnut Creek is truly on the forefront for uh, homelessness, and I know uh, surrounding jurisdictions are also on the forefront. Uh, it is something that we take seriously. But um, I know we have a lot of questions that we want to get to. Uh, I am basically the liaison uh, for the police department in uh, dealing with the homeless population, dealing with homelessness, the issues, uh, the crimes that are being committed um, with our homeless. We do address those. We have a zero tolerance for that. And um, if somebody is committing crimes in our community, they're not welcome. Uh, you know, we'll work with the Trinity Center if they're, if they're um, causing a problem, if they're uh, making it unsafe for the community, then we deal with that. Um, we work closely with the district attorney's office in getting these cases prosecuted. And oftentimes when they get into the criminal justice system, it forces them into some kind of service, maybe some substance abuse rehabilitation, something like that, where they normally wouldn't do so on their own. So it does help out. Uh, there are ways to do that if they want to take advantage of it, and that's kind of our way to get that in there. So um, I don't really have much more to say, but um, when there is a question about homeless and there, it comes to the police department, it usually comes through me first. Uh, we do have sector commanders. Each of our, uh, our city is broken up into four different sectors. I manage the downtown sector, and we have other... Uh, three other lieutenants that manage uh, different areas in town. So each sector commander is responsibility for homeless issues in their particular sector. Um, but I'm more of the clearinghouse to figure out um, which sector it goes to. So uh, I sit on the homeless task force. I attend the county council for homelessness meetings, uh, work very closely with Donna. We've uh, been working together ever since she, she started at Trinity Center, actually worked with prior uh, um, prior leadership over at um, Fresh Start, when it was Fresh Start, uh, so it's kind of know what's going on. So um, I'm excited to answer questions tonight. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a forum for questions. Uh, I know maybe a lot of you have some anger about the problem. I live here in Walnut Creek as well. Uh, maybe you are for um, finding some solutions. Maybe you're totally against it. It's a divided population. I hear from everybody who calls into the police department uh, from 
getting them on a bus and getting them out of our community to how can I help? What can I do to uh, address this problem? What can I do to help manage this problem? And that's what we're hoping for is our homeless task force is a community-based task force. This is supposed to be um, community members on this task force addressing issues, bringing issues to us so we can address them and kind of go from there. So when we talked about if you're interested in participating and you want to help out, please, we encourage you 100% to help out if you want to help out because there is a need and we will put you to work. So uh, thank you and I hope that uh, we can keep our questions, uh, we, you know, hopefully till about 8.30. Um, but uh, we want to keep it um, civil and I know some emotions will come up and I know some things will come up. But um, if you can control uh, tempers, control behavior, and just have a great information sharing, uh, education forum, we'll walk out of here successful. Walk, we'll walk out of here better. That's what we want to be. We want to be better. We want Walnut Creek to be the best when it comes to dealing with our homeless um, problem and managing the problem. So with your help, we can be the best. So thank you. I'm John Haithcock, also from your police department. Um, I'm here to help facilitate uh, this event this evening with these very informed experts who are uh, in the same frame of mind that all of you are. We are here to help, here to support this issue, here to try to find solutions to this issue together. Um, it's a complex situation for all communities and all citizens. And if we all kind of band together, maybe we can get down that road a little more successfully each year. Um, question cards are around the room, so if questions come up and you want to write something down, please do so and uh, they'll come to me. I'm going to go through them as hopefully to get 100% of them answered tonight. Hopefully we can get that done for all of you. Can you talk about the new residences being built? Is it different than low-income housing? What are the qualifications to be able to live there and where is it going to be? So I don't know if that's um, a specific development that's being asked about, but in general, um, when you like the development that you see going on, some of the development has affordable housing included in it. Our our requirement, our inclusionary requirement, is 10% um, affordable to low income. Um, but the developer can also pay a fee in lieu of that. And so sometimes we'll have, um, a, you know, a, approximately 10% of the units will be affordable. And if it's a rental project, um, that generally means that, th that it might be, through our inclusionary ordinance, it's either affordable to people at 80% of area median income or people at 50% of area median income. And then when we have the fees, we use those fees to subsidize 100% affordable projects. And we do have some development happening right now that are 100% affordable. We have Riviera Family Apartments, which is 58 units. That is going to be um, leasing up soon. It's nearing the end of construction. So we're gonna be, um, they're gonna be accepting applications in the next few months and leasing up. And those are, um, I would say on generally, those are households earning, you know, maybe between $30,000 and, and $60,000 a year, $60,000, maybe up to eighty. It depends on the size of the household. And the rents may vary between um, $700 and $1,300, um, about that. And then St. Paul's Commons, which is the project that, that um, Donna talked about, that's going to be... Um, a lot of those will be smaller units. It'll be studios and one bedrooms. Um, and those are going to be um, affordable. Some of them will be deeply subsidized, affordable to people at 30% of AMI, 40% of AMI. So those are people who are oftentimes on um, fixed incomes that are, are, are getting um, Social Security or are underemployed so, or, or employed at very low income jobs. Um, I'm, was there a second part to the question? Where can people go to find more information? Oh, yes. Yeah, so um, you can go to, if you go to the, the housing um, division page on the city's website and there's information in the back on that, we actually have a, 
a way that you can sign up to be notified of all new affordable housing opportunities. And through that, you would get notified when applications become available, when um, projects are being developed, when below market rate ownership units become available. And then we also have it posted on our website as well, if there are applications available, if there are units coming online. Um, yeah. Thank you. Some homeless folks are fortunate to have a vehicle they can sleep in. Do police or sheriff's departments target these people or do they try to steer them to the park to park in areas that are okay? Is this on? <laughs> can you hear me? I'll try to talk loud until my mic comes up, but yes, that is a, a concern. There are uh, lessons that we're learning from other uh, jurisdictions on this particular issue, and I know uh, our city council is also looking into it. So uh, what if other jurisdictions are doing? Okay, and other jurisdictions are doing is they're allowing um, those that are homeless and are living in their vehicles to do so in certain areas of the city. Uh, generally not in residential areas. So uh, a lot of the courts and uh, case laws in our courts right now are sympathetic to that. And what they look for is if they can't do it here, then where can they go? Uh, so when it comes to enforcement, uh, we have to be very careful about uh, how we do that. And then if we have specific codes that are established that will allow uh, individuals to stay in their cars in certain areas of the city, we can enforce that. And then if they're found in residential areas where they're not supposed to be, we can enforce that too if there's codes on, on our books. So it is something that we're looking at. We're looking at uh, locations. Uh, where do we do this? Do we do this on private property? Do we do this on city property? Uh, so there's a lot of issues um, when it comes down to liability. If something happens and we're allowing this, how do we deal with the liability? So we're looking into it and right now, um, we're hoping that some uh, churches can open up some parking lots and uh, see if we can get them into private property. So it is a uh, issue for the particular property owner that has to deal with it. But right now, uh, it is something that we're looking at. So I think I answered that. Uh, this may need to be addressed by a few of you, an opportunity here. What help do you need other than financial? I guess I'll start. <laughs> uh, of course, active citizenry. Uh, one of the, the biggest things from a city council perspective, from a political perspective, we want to hear from all of you uh, and those of you that are, that are watching online. Uh, the city council has uh, put a lot of effort and emphasis behind this, and we're extremely interested in hearing what path the community wants us to go down, whether it's on homelessness issues or the availability, affordability of housing or any of the other issues in which we're working on. So participating in forums like this or coming down to the city council or even reaching out to the, your individual city council members to say where you're at, what you're interested in doing is uh, very important to me and other council members. Uh, and then of course, volunteering. Uh, there's lots of great organizations out there, many of the, which are represented here tonight that are always looking for active volunteers in the community to come out to, to help the, the people that are less fortunate than all of us. And I would actually echo that, um, get informed and get noisy. Um, and the Council on Homelessness has um, monthly meetings where they talk, are talking sort of big picture, those meetings are open to the public, and then every quarter we have um, what are called continuum of care meetings, where we usually have like a panel discussion on a particular topic. Um, but I, the Council on Homelessness is really starting to move um, in a direction of working on advocacy at the county level, um, but also once the Board of Supervisors comes out sort of in favor of something, it's easier for advocates then to go city to city um, and, and ask for different things. So um, I'm, I'm going to stick around afterwards. I'm happy to give you my card and I'll bombard you with emails about all sorts of things happening. We're also looking for representation on the Homeless Task Force too, like I spoke about. Um, this is our community. Uh, the county has a lot of uh, outreach uh, systems but this is our community we take care of our community if you want to volunteer you can either get a hold of me or you could get a hold of Donna uh, or Jenny Kuhata, uh, who also works with the Trinity Center um, and if you want to volunteer like I said we'll put you to work so there are opportunities out there and you could use it I would agree with that there are lots and lots all of us have volunteer openings and as I mentioned before it takes a lot of people uh, to solve a big, huge problem. There are so many aspects to it. And you may have the expertise that we've been looking for, we just haven't um, been uncovered you yet. 
Um, there's advocacy, there's actually working on site, there's um, somebody mentioned other than financial. Well, financial is a big concern for all of us, and so helping us raise funds, doing a fundraising event, donations uh, f um, for food and clothing, all those things. There's many, many, many things that the communi community can do, and it works really well when we work together. Do you want to provide so many services that homeless are attached to Walnut Creek? Well, I'll speak about that. <laughs> My job is if a person lives in Walnut Creek, lost their housing here, and wants to get back into housing, and then we're going to help them do that. If a person um, wants something different than that, then we're going to help them do that. So we have, I know that was kind of funny, but it's true. So we have people that come in and we peel back, we sit down and we peel back the onion about what is it that they're looking for, what do they want to do, what is, why did they come to us? So it could be a job, it could be uh, I have a disability, it could be I'm losing my housing, I don't know what to do, it could be, you know, I just want to shower because I'm fine living where I am. So we and, and our staff, there are some, some of our case managers are here tonight, sit down with people, our volunteers sit down with people. The other thing that we try to do is provide a community for people that do not have um, um, someone to talk to. Because sometimes when you're sitting and talking with someone, you discover they do have family. And maybe we can do some reunification. So now maybe that person's family is in, we do have one person's family who, who moved to Florida and so we were able to help them move back with their family, kind of get back together and bridge that divide that happened. So now that person's not here anymore. And I think we have four or five. One went to Hawaii, one went to, um, two went to Florida, actually. But in any case, we, um, if a person has lost their housing here, we try to help them regain it. If it's somewhere else, we try to help them get there. We had a, um, a gentleman who, desperately wanted to live in Walnut Creek because where he was from was a bad area and he wanted to get out of that life. So we worked with him, I've known him now for a couple of years and um, when he first came to us he looked pretty scary but now he has um, completely changed his outlook, understands that if he's going to climb up out of the pit that he's in, he needs to go somewhere else because he can't make it here. And so he just recently got housed, not here, but in Pittsburgh. And, and I think it's going to work out really, really well for him. Um, it's permanent supportive housing and we don't have that here. So that's why it was difficult for him to be here. He needed to have supportive housing. Hopefully we'll have that soon. And I just wanted to add one thing. I think from the county perspective, I can reflect that, you know, when we do our point in time counts, we ask, where did you lose your housing? Or why are you in this community? And usually it is that they are from that community. And I think you heard a couple folks say, like, I just didn't know there were homeless in my community. There always have been, and there still are. And providing services doesn't necessarily mean more people are coming, but it means you're able to provide support to your neighbors that really need it. I'll, I'll just add a couple things onto this. The, the the police uh, organization does a very good job working with local other organizations to ensure that Walnut Creek is not becoming the location for this to send all the homeless. That is something that that is not occurring, that doesn't occur uh, in the, in a rare circumstance where it would occur. I can guarantee you, the chief would be all over that situation in working with other chiefs in the, in, in our communities. The second thing is uh, these individuals are here, whether the services are here or not. Our goal is, of course, to not get people addicted to the services, it's to get them off the street so they don't need the services in the first place. The last thing I'll say is uh, I volunteer every year at, the, uh, at St. John Vianney as part of the Interfaith Coalition for Winter Nights. And one of the, the major takeaways that I've, I've had through that experience is a lot of these individuals are no different than you and me. The only difference is they just are working as hard as us, they just cannot make enough money to get ahead. Mm -hmm. and the way that I look at the situation is would we rather have them on the street and go into the darkness or would we rather have these programs that get them off the street and hopefully get, wean them in, uh, back into uh, a situation that uh, is much better for them, them and their children? Uh, I think the answer is clear 
and that's why uh, myself and the rest of the city council is all, is very encouraged and very supportive of the efforts of those individuals on on the stage and, and elsewhere in our community According to the Department of Public Health, as of March 23, 2018, California is experiencing one of the largest hepatitis outbreaks in the United States. The majority of patients are homeless and or use illicit drugs. What is Walnut Creek doing to sanitize public areas, for example, the library, the park, city hall, etc.? So as somebody from the health department, I can answer that. So we, of course, have been very concerned about the hepatitis outbreaks happening in Southern California. There have been lots of phone calls, been lots of information from the state. And what I can tell you is that we are not experiencing that same issue up here in Northern California. Um, there's been lots of conversations about it. So there hasn't been a need to do sort of this like bleaching of the streets. And, um, and I understand why people are scared, right? Hepatitis is not fun and it spreads pretty quickly. Um, what I can tell you from the health department is that, that we don't have that concern at this time in this part of the, in this part of the state. And I would like to also add that we are being proactive. We're working closely with Healthcare for the Homeless mm -hmm. to do complete hepatitis A vaccines. We're getting as many people vaccinated as we can. So it, in the event that something like that happens, we're prepared. Can you please put signs on the bathrooms near the playgrounds with a time limit on use of the bathrooms since homeless people spend a lot of time in there and toddlers need to urinate <laughs> <laughs> a lot um, I, I think we'll, we'll thank you for pointing that out we'll take note and we'll 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 work with the organizations within the city to address this i see uh our city manager here and I, i'm sure he's taking copious <laughs> notes and uh, we can address that uh, from a city perspective yeah and the police department often gets called out on those situations uh, we do know a couple of individuals that are doing that and uh, we've actually worked with the district attorney's office to find the proper code so if we do arrest this person they're willing to prosecute and that's happened uh, before it was uh, really didn't you know the DA's office and uh, they just didn't want to see the case they're very very busy they have a lot of cases and uh, there are a few individuals uh, that are out there that are doing it um, on a regular basis, and those are the individuals that we're addressing specifically over at Civic Park and then also over at uh, Walden Park. So uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a health issue. It is uh, an accessibility issue. It is something that's important to us. Um, but uh, the, the part that really troubled the police department is that when people were knocking on the door, the person was getting aggressive, and that's a problem for us. Uh, we want our community to be safe. We want you to be safe when you're using our parks. And if you're not safe, then we're going to step in and we're going to do everything that we can and we've done that. So um, if it continues, signs would be a great uh, way for us to, again, additionally enforce it. So if there's time limits and it's just another way to say, hey, look at the sign, it, you know, okay, I, I get it, I'll move on. So um, it is something that we've uh, handled, so yeah. Can someone please go into detail about streamlined building? What precisely does that entail? So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, when we are looking to streamline development, it can, in, it can involve uh, many different aspects of the project. So it might be processing their application for the entitlements um, more quickly or um, allowing it to be approved with fewer public meetings. Um, it's also working sort of with our processes and, and, and making some changes and updates to our processes that allow um, certain things to be maybe approved by right where it's not um, it doesn't require as many public hearings and there are there is actually a lot of state legislation right now some of it that's already passed and is implemented and some that is proposed that requires cities to increase um, the streamlining of developments and usually that involves um, that things certain types of projects within certain parameters would get their approvals quicker and if they get their approvals quicker, then they can get the building permit quicker and they can get into construction quicker. And for, for developers, I think um, certainty with the timing of things really matters a lot. And it can make a big difference in their ability to be able to make a decision about moving forward with a project or a decision about whether or not a project is gonna pencil out financially is the more certainty they have on many different aspects. So, Streamlining may also be um, how quickly we can process the building permits, um, how well we coordinate within the departments in the city to get all of the permits um, that are required issued, 
and um, there are other things that can be streamlined. I'm not necessarily thinking of them, but but primarily it's it's being able to give developers certainty and understanding if you do these certain things, your project will be approved. Uh, yeah, I would use the word optimization. Optim and I think that's what you're what yeah. you're hitting on. We're we're really taking the existing process that we have today today and optimizing it. Mm -hmm. Yes, there may be less public hearings but the same uh, ability for the public to come down and, and communicate and provide input to commissions or if it does right, or come to the city council level, it's still there. It's just optimizing the process for developers or for individual members that are wanting to do development on your, your property. The second thing is, is that it's uh, incorporating constant feedback. So the, the, development, or the or development arm of the city uh, spends a copious amount of time uh, asking for feedback for those individuals that are going through the process, and then they reincorporate the feedback that they get in, in order to improve uh, the permitting process. The last thing is, and this is one of the things that Margo's working on, is uh, allowing individuals that are doing low-income housing to get to the front of the line. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things ar around the entitlement process is it takes a, a very long time, and uh, for especially for low-income housing that are having problems penciling their projects out in the first place, we want to make sure that we are giving them as much of a leg up to get their project to the, end, uh, the finish line as possible. Yeah, it takes, takes a village to get a project going pretty much anywhere. So um, we're really coordinating our efforts. And, and we do have a process right now, a big project that we've been doing in the city called the Blueprint for Success, which is really focused on, on really this, how do we and we've done a lot of outreach with developers and um, with the community to say like, how, how will this work better? What can we do to, to make things more clear, to make the process easier and more accessible um, to everyone on every part of the process? For those of you that are yeah. interested, you can Google Blueprint for Success mm -hmm. Walnut Creek and you can see what the, uh, community, the community development organization is doing. It actually, the city just won a, uh, I forget what the organization was, but one of the, the development organizations out there, uh, we just won a reward for the efforts in which the, w w in, we're, we're working on the city and other cities are looking at replicating that in their communities. I just wanted to add how important this is. So like when I'm out talking to the community, if we decided today we were going to build some affordable housing, in most communities it would take about seven years until somebody could move in. And a lot of it is pulling together all that funding. So like Donna's been working on this project for years, trying to pull all that together. Speed, fast tracking the permitting is huge, um, but it's really pulling together the funding and then getting the, it takes an absurd amount of time, way more than I ever could have imagined. So this, I mean, that's huge, that's critical. What are the criteria for admission into a shelter? It is my understanding that homeless people are not allowed to keep their possessions or pets if admitted to a shelter. Um, I can answer that. So uh, we have three county shelters. We have the Philip Dorm Respite Center and the Concord Shelter, um, both located on Arnold Industrial Way. And we also have a Brookside Shelter in the city of Richmond. Um, it is true that uh, an, an individual who has a dog that is not a service animal uh, would not be permitted to have that dog at our facility. However, uh, the only other entry for requirement, or requirement for entry is that you are 18 or older. Um, we will take you uh, as long as you're 18 or older. Um, we are a wet, wet, wet shelter, so it's harm reduction. Uh, you're not allowed to use drugs or drink uh, in the facility, but uh, if you go out and use your alcohol and then come back to the facility, uh, we'll put you to bed because it's safer for you to be there than it is for you to be in the community. And I would just say, so those are the county shelters, and Donna, you can talk about yours. There's probably eight-ish different shelters in the county, um, and they all kind of have different requirements. Some of them let you stay longer than others. Um, you know, some have dry requirements, some don't. So it really depends on who's running the shelter. Yeah, so we have the same as the county shelters for the, um, the winter shelter at the armory. We do allow dogs if they are a service animal. Uh, we did have, uh, I think, an average of two to three this winter. Um, and I have to say, people who are living outside or homeless, their dogs are some of the most well-trained dogs I've ever met in my entire life. Um, so it is very sad because that's a deterrent. Mm -hmm. People will not leave their pets. I wouldn't leave my pet. 
And so it keeps them outside. We don't have an answer. We'd like to find an answer. So that's something maybe we can work on as a community. How do we care for those pets while someone can come inside and get the help that they need? At our day program, again, we do allow if an animal is under the control of their people, their person, uh, they're a service animal, or they're on leash and they have all their shots and they have vaccinations, they have flea treatments and all of those kinds of things because our staff doesn't want flea bites either. So um, we try very, very hard to be tolerant, but there are limits to that. Yeah. Can you just share some information on what it would take for an individual to get, a, get into the winter shelter at the armory? At the armory, um, there is an intake process, the same as there is for our day program. So if someone comes to us through, through 211, and you all received a flyer on 211, that's the referral service, um, they will come to us and say, I want to get into the shelter, then they'll come in, meet with us, they'll meet with one of our case managers and we go through the rules and regulations we find out um, what the person is looking for is it um, long-term housing that they need is it short-term because they're just waiting to get into a program um, and so we make it very clear that if they come into the program we are a dry shelter we do not allow you to come in under the influence so you need to be able to manage if you're using alcohol or drugs from 7 at night till 7 in the morning. And we have a number of people that can do that. Um, other than that, um, yeah, they, they sign an agreement that, uh, for the rules. The other thing we ask them to do is meet. It's not, it doesn't keep them out, but we ask them to meet with a case manager on a weekly basis to, to put together some goals. Where am I going to go at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the shelter? Am I going back to the street? Am I going back to the car? Where am I going to go? So the, the goal is that they don't do that. But I will tell you, 80%, at least 80% of the people who sit with our case managers on a plan, a, a little word, it doesn't have to be big, are successful. They do move on into either temporary or permanent housing or back with families. Those that choose not to engage with us are the least successful. We hear much about how much is spent, how much is provided, housing, meals, etc. What is the end game here? How many have been moved off of assistance into stable housing? How do you measure success? One day at a time. <laughs> yeah, we actually, so I might put our, our evaluator for the county is here. And um, I'm trying to remember, Dana, I don't know if you know offhand, um, sort of what our movement into permanent shelter is. So I actually came as a spectator, so I did not pull out the percentages. Sorry, sorry. I didn't know if you had rough. <laughs> no rough, but the answer is actually a little, um, so I was trying to say that people go through CORE, then they go to a shelter, then they go to housing navigation, and they kind of go through the system in a step process. So once people get to something like housing navigation, and that's where they've, they've gone through the steps to become housed, they've got the documents, they've proven that they've got disabilities, they've proven their income, um, housing, once they're at that point, it's, uh, I, I don't know the percentage, but it's, I mean, it's more than 50%. The challenge is we have a lot of people that haven't moved that, through that system because of all the things we're talking about tonight, the complexities. Many people stay unhoused and, shelt and, and homeless for years. Yeah. So I kind of look at them in chunks, but the people that have moved through the system successfully have really good exit rates. Yeah, and I was going to say, for, thank you, Dana. Sorry, yeah. I owe you. <laughs> <laughs> chocolate bar um, for folks that we get into permanent supportive housing so that's where you have a housing voucher that's paid for and you have services ongoing our retention rate is about 98 percent for people staying in that housing once you can get somebody in the type of housing model that they really need and it's way less expensive than having them in a shelter and way less expensive than having them out in the community incurring lots of health costs lots of law enforcement costs um, public works, having to clean up garbage. It's so much cheaper to house people. Um, the big challenge that we're really facing is lack of units and landlords that are willing to rent to, to the folks that we work with. So I can tell you for the winter shelter at the armory, um, it's, and this is the last night by the way, uh, we had a total of 75 unique people over the season. And um, of those 
people. Seven have moved on to longer term emergency shelters. Eight have gone to transitional housing, which means that they've gone into a sober living situation. They're living with uh, family or friends' um, houses. And uh, we've had two go into a long-term treatment and recovery program, and four into permanent housing. And how that happened, I don't know, in a county that has none. And so, yahoo. <laughs> Seems like a small number, but it's really not. It's a huge number. The other thing I'll say is, uh, just by the, the question, this isn't a binary dis discussion. It's not like we provide the services, and therefore the homeless people are here. The homeless people are already here. So that the first conversation is already done. Now we have now since we have homeless individuals in the in our population, we have to decide what services or what are we going to do to try to get them off the street or get them uh, mental care or what have you. From firsthand experience, my uncle has been homeless most of my life. I can tell you that these services are much more effective and much cheaper than uh, if they weren't there. From a, co from a healthcare perspective, from a locking them up, or God forbid having them unfortunately pass away, I can tell you that these services, uh, I've said it before, the services like what Donna Colombo provides, they're true angels to these people in need. They have, my family is, so, uh, is fairly successful and my uncle has turned to services like what Trinity Center provides for the basic of needs. Uh, these services that are provided are, again, much cheaper than anything else that, that, that we can do, of course, other than getting them into long-term okay. permanent housing. There are multiple homeless members of the Walnut Creek community who have remained homeless over decades. What is the story with these folks? How is the issue of perpetual or extended homelessness being addressed? So for us, I can tell you I know a lot of those people. Um, uh, over the years, we've established a relationship, and that is the, one, the best way is to establish a relationship because <coughs> something triggered in that person's life, and it's different for everybody, that is keeping them from a traditional living arrangement. They um, be, will tell me, I don't want to come inside. I like living on the creek. I you know, like my freedom. I don't want to abide by your rules. So I think there's always going to be, I think we used to call, I read about this in history because I'm not that old, hobos. <laughs> so. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not anything new. There are people who prefer to live outside of society's constraint. And we do have a few people in Walnut Creek. And by the way, they're lovely people. Um, and so what do we do? We keep talking to them. Um, I'll just use Bob. That may not be his real name, but I'll take so Bob. It's getting harder and harder to live on that creek. The city's getting bigger and bigger. There are more and more people. There are more and more rules. There's more and more concerns. They're saying, what are you going to do? You're not going to be able to live there forever, so how can we help you? I'm not going to tell you what he told me, <laughs> but we just keep at it. I've known him for five years, and we just keep at it, because sooner or later, I think he's going to say yes. And I think that's where the core teams come in. Mm -hmm. I know this is a lot of what you guys do. That's right. Mm -hmm. One thing we're really noticing also is that there's a lot of trauma related to yes. individuals who are living outside. Yes. Um, one thing that we're really true? trying to dive into is adverse childhood experiences. Yes. Things that happened when they were children that have led them to the decisions that they're making currently. Um, nobody was four years old and said, I'm going to be homeless when I grow up. Guaranteed. They were police officers, fire, firefighters, teachers, astronauts. They had dreams. Something happened along the way that killed those dreams. They've lost hope. So what we try to do is focus on those, on those traumas that they've experienced, really help them intervene in those moments, and then really try to help them move past that. And what better way to do it than teaming up with them, letting it be their idea of what they want to do, team up with them, and just walk beside them. And I think Donna and her team really does that. We do that really well, too. For those who want to be homeless, is there any area set aside for camping, tents, sleeping bags, et cetera, instead of the streets? Um, I mean, so we've talked about this at the county. There are places in other parts of the country where they have what are basically sanctioned encampments. 
um, or they have like a whole parking pad. Um, and you know, we've, we've sort of talked about that and are still looking about that as an option, um, especially honestly as, as unsheltered homelessness just keeps growing exponentially. You know, like I live in Oakland and we're really, really seeing it, um, but we're seeing it here in Contra Costa too. To my knowledge, there are not sanctioned areas like that, um, but it is something other communities are looking at. And I will say in, oh, I want to say Bay Point, um, so the Interfaith Council, um, Will McGarvey, they are piloting basically like a safe park program, basically where like I think six families can be parked in an area. Um, and I don't think it's quite up and running, but they're looking at sort of piloting that, you know, maybe having a porta potty and having a staff member. Um, but again, the thing that comes back to is cost. What's cost effective? And it sounds like a horrible thing to say, right? Like it's not about money, it's about people. But you need money to give services for people and trying to figure out what's going to make the most amount of sense. So there's a long way to say, to my knowledge, there are not sanctioned areas, um, but it is something that other communities look at. I think it is one of the things on the task force list that we've talked about. How, you know, is that viable in this area and how could we do it and how would it be funded and how would it be managed because those are all all issues um, we don't have an answer so if you have an idea or an answer please come and help us out with that just from a police department perspective on that uh, we don't have there's some jurisdictions that have a no camping ordinance uh, it's uh, citywide Walnut Creek does not have that the only ordinance we have for prohibiting camping is in our city parks so uh, there are other areas within the city that have generated a lot of concern for the community and a lot of, um, a lot of complaints come out of those particular locations, uh, mainly uh, the overpasses, uh, creek beds. Uh, we do see a lot of encampments through there. So a lot of it is through uh, different jurisdictions, flood control, Caltrans. We work, uh, we've been working much closer with them in the last five years than we ever have before. Uh, to uh, mitigate those encampments. Uh, just this week, we, uh, we cleaned up four encampments at different locations. And uh, again, this was a police department issue in the past. Our city uh, crews now are going out and they're helping out with the cleanup, so it's, it's much more expedited. We do have laws surrounding posting the encampment, giving them opportunities to get into shelters, using our core team to get them into shelters. We can't just go in and clean it up. Uh, they have rights, and uh, we, we want to protect that. We want to protect their property. We'll store it for 90 days if we need to, to get them into a shelter. Uh, so we do have avenues to, to, or at least avenues of opportunity to get them into um, some place uh, off the streets. But uh, again, like I mentioned before, the courts, uh, it, it is one of those things where if you can't, if you're going to restrict them here, then where can they go? Yes. And so. A lot of the jurisdictions that have these no camping ordinances, uh, they're going to have to start building shelters. Some of those jurisdictions have done that. Uh, they spend millions and millions of dollars building shelters to give them an opportunity to, okay, you can't go here, but we're going to put you here. Uh, you'll be safer here and you'll be uh, under a roof. So uh, what does that look like for Walnut Creek? We don't know. Uh, sanctioned encampments, uh, from what I've heard from other jurisdictions, it's not a good idea. There are issues, there are crimes that are committed. There are fires, there's health issues, there's, uh, uh, it just, it's hard for, uh, you know, there's no real um, core control of what's going on inside that encampment. So um, from my perspective as in the police department and from the police department's perspective, uh, sanctioned encampments are, is, is not something that we want to see here in Walnut Creek. But um, we do want to get those into shelters that we can get into and uh, we'll, we'll stay on top of those encampment uh, areas that are causing the most complaints and keep them clear. So, uh, but there are other places for them to go and we want to just keep that open. So, I just want to add one quick thing that you touched on. So there are communities that look at um, basic criminali basically criminalizing homelessness. So no camping, no sitting, no lying. Um, the issue with those laws is that it doesn't actually solve the problem. You have law enforcement spending a lot of time issuing citations that are never going to get paid and it doesn't actually like move the people along. Um, so I just, as people are thinking about what are possible options, that has sort of shown time and time again not to be particularly effective um, and actually use up resource, 
right, for just like sitting or standing or lying. If it's a health and safety issue, like that's a, that's a different issue. But just like sitting there, um, those kinds of laws just actually don't work. <laughs> That's true. We had no choice. We have to find other ways to serve the community. Uh, you can only write so many citations. You can only make so many arrests. And we were, um, for the lack of a better term, we were really spinning our wheels with a lot of individuals that were out there and committing crimes. Those that are committing, um, a lot of the, the crimes that are committed are property crimes. And uh, stealing food, stealing alcohol uh, from our local grocery stores, uh, uh, getting handouts uh, from individuals in the community, giving them money. Um, it is. We, we want to get the, the services to them. So instead of giving them money, maybe a, give them a cup of coffee and say, hey, you know, call 211, get them into services. Would you like to take some services? Or There's we, resource cards at the back table. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, handing out money doesn't help. Um, it, you may think it helps. And what it does is it just perpetuates the issue. So um, food is the best thing and then offering services so we want to make sure that everyone knows about white pony everyone knows about trinity center everybody knows about all the services that we can give to them instead of giving them money because there's opportunities out there for them so um, again I'll, what jamie was saying it was it's true and uh when it comes to felony uh crimes that are harming people no tolerance uh, but if they're stealing food, we need to have food available for them. So if they're hungry, we can get them food so they won't steal from our grocery stores. So. What help is given to those with hidden disabilities that cannot hold a job or are denied services? The question was what kind of help? What help, yes. Um, I mean, I think it depends on their point of entry and what their needs are, but all of our care centers, so as Donna said, there's three care centers in our, in our county. <coughs> Um, also poor outreach teams, really what they're designed to do is sort of be almost like the admissions in the ER, right? And they're triaging. Okay, what's going on with you and what do you need? And then getting them to those specialty departments, getting them connected with mental health care, getting them connected with physical health care. Part of why these relationships are so important, so like Michael Fisher and his team, right? They go out, the core teams go out. They may visit somebody eight times before they do anything other than drop socks and water. But what they're doing while they're dropping socks and water is building a relationship, right? So if Justin's coming out and he's seeing me eight times and every time I'm like, I want nothing from you. That eighth time, finally I'm like, well, I heard you help my buddy over there and actually I'm having this issue and like maybe I can trust you. We've built a relationship, even if it's, you know, minimal. He's connected, right? So the core teams are connected to all these resources. And then, uh, so I'm a public health nerd, right? We talk about stages of change. You know, sometimes people are in pre-contemplation. They're like not even thinking about it, but maybe they're contemplating doing something. And part of what these services are designed to do is like kind of be there and maybe nudge people to that next stage of change so that when they're finally ready with the end point, which ideally is housing, they've been able to be facilitated to that point and have what they need to, to get there. How did we get to this housing shortage? What can we do to not let this happen again? That's yours. <laughs> I mean, the, the, a lot of it right now is, is really a supply and demand issue. So how did we get to the housing shortage? There's just been, since the recession, there's been very strong economic growth in, in the region and in California. And a lot of new jobs um, have come to the area and we just haven't had the, the development of housing to keep up with it. And there's a lot of different reasons. I mean. So one of them is, yeah, there's a lot of new jobs, there's a lot of new residents, people coming to the area. And then some of the reasons why the housing doesn't get developed as quickly um, has to do with um, a variety of factors. So it might be the cost of development, it might be um, the length of time for development, it might be um, the, there might be certain regulatory barriers that, that make it harder to develop um, or harder to develop at the density that might be needed. Um, so it's, it's a myriad of things and there's a lot of effort right now throughout the state to try to address um, a lot of the barriers to to the housing development and to being able to um, meet the demand and so I'm sure you've heard a lot about it I think it's the information is out there um, and pretty kind of pretty at the forefront of conversation about a lot of new bills that have been passed and things that the state are doing um, to sort of expedite the development of housing to make it easier to develop housing to make it quicker to develop it um, and then new funding sources to for affordable housing so um, 
the supply and demand issue is a huge a huge piece of the the high housing cost but it's not the only piece and so um just rushing more units it isn't going to necessarily address the affordability issue um, as quickly and and to the degree that we need it and so it's also really important to have the the development of subsidized and re rent restricted and resale restricted affordable housing um, if we wait for it to trickle down through market rate development it's going to take a long time um, for a lot of those reasons so there's a lot happening to try to fix it and you know the one of the big issues that is peop that's being confronted right now is the cost of construction mm -hmm. so the cost of construction has really gone up we had the affordable project that's moving forward at st paul's commons um, you know the bids came in 25 percent higher than even the highest bid the highest like imaginable cost for the project and it and that the developer is a nonprofit developer it's a hundred percent affordable project really had to scramble to try to find the additional financing that was needed the panel keeps talking about the progress made in the past 10 years but that's not the experience for residents in the last two years the problem has gotten much worse so how can you say so much progress has been made Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on how you define progress. I think one of the things that's changed, especially in the last year, is just visibility, right? So people being homeless is much more visible than it has been in the past. Um, but if we look at data, right, if we're data driven, if we look at the data that we have, we can actually see until the last, I'm curious to see what this year looks like. But the trends have really been that homelessness is generally going down. Um, and I think particularly as the economy is getting better. What I will say is that's probably not true for every demographic group. Um, so there's probably, I mean, we know that there are some inequities there, but as, as a trend overall, homelessness has been going down, although, you know, the crisis, this pretty acute crisis in the last year or two. Um, but again, I guess it depends on how you define progress or, you know, uh, success. So if it's that you don't want to see it, then yeah, we're failing. <laughs> And when you I say it's going down, you mean it's going down in Contra Costa. If you look across our state, if you look across the country, there may be pockets, LA, San yeah. Diego, that are seeing something completely different from a data perspective. Yeah. But here in Contra Costa, I think we, we showed it today and yeah. tonight that the, the line is going down, yeah. which is where we want it to be going. And I think the data, the data is not out this year for our point in time count, which is like one of the ways that we kind of take the temperature. I think it is going to be higher. Um, that's going to be true for the whole state. But overall, over the last 10 years, there has been a downward trend. And I think too, what has changed uh, as a positive is that we're working collaboratively yes. now. Mm -hmm. Trinity's yes. not working in a vacuum. We are working with county, we're working with city, we're working mm -hmm. with other service agencies, we're working with hospitals. We're working with um, care social workers and other care providers, and it used to be we worked in silos, and now we're working mm -hmm. side by side and cross-functional. It's been awesome. Mm -hmm. We recently had we have a lot of um, people showing up on our doors at the end of the day that have been brought there in a taxi from a hospital, mm -hmm. thinking we had beds. Well, we don't have beds, so if we close the door, then they're on the street. So we're working with the hospitals, and they're agreeing, no, that should never happen. And so we're, we're working more collaboratively now to make sure that that doesn't happen, that people do get where they need to go from a hospital situation. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. We're working with the police in the, in the city, and I, I, I think it's phenomenal. I, in the five years that I've been working, I think there's been a complete 360 degree turn and I think give us a little bit more time and we'll really make a big dent. But you also need to understand that our population's growing, the um, economics change, the uh, availability of housing, the cost of land, I mean, it all changes. So it's not, it's not a straight downward or straight upward, it's, it's an ebb and flow, thank you. Yeah, the progress, you know, that was a word that I used and from my perspective and what I've been doing for uh, this issue, the, the communication and the networking has been the biggest piece of the progress. Uh, the police department was again just the, that was the entity to solve the problem. That was the entity to deal with the problem. 
Um, and now um, we're, we're not the sole entity. It is a city effort, it is a county effort, it is a state effort, it's a nationwide effort. And uh, all of the conferences that I've been to addressing this issue, uh, just recently we were down in Long Beach, we had a long conference, it was a national-wide conference on homelessness. And the picture is, um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it is growing. And uh, what we see in other jurisdictions and not so much in Walnut Creek is it is, it is a, almost out of control. Uh, just New York City was out there, LAPD was out there. 365,000 individuals are homeless in, in the city of LA. It is a small city inside LA. So uh, they're camping along uh, the canals, they're camp and the visibility is, 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 it is out there. Um, the New York City PD, they have uh, officers that patrol. Their sole job is to patrol the shelters. Uh, they have shelters available and that's what their job is. Is Walnut Creek there? No. You look at the broad uh, picture of homelessness, Walnut Creek is sitting well. Yeah, they're out there. Yeah, they're visible. Yeah, they're in certain parts of the city. Um, but we are dealing with it. We are talking about dealing with it. We never did this before. I, I assure you as a community that we've never done this before. And that's where the progress comes. The progress comes in the communication. The progress comes in the partnerships. And um, if you think progress is less homeless in Walnut Creek, then that's a, that, there's no way to gauge that. So as long as we continue to communicate, as long as we continue to work together, we will manage this issue. Um, but we won't let it, we won't uh, find a solution. So. So it's 8.30 and we talked about um, ending the session at 8.30. Um, they are going to extend till nine, but for those of you who might need to get up and leave at this time, please feel free to do so. Um, I don't think all our panelists can even stay. So uh, maybe we'll take a, you know, 60 second little break here and let people kind of get, some water and get up and oh, it's hot. move about. So let us free up our panel to answer a few more questions here. Thanks for coming. Can youth participate in the core program as a volunteer, maybe even with parents or as a family? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Can youth participate in the core program as a volunteer, maybe even as a parent or with parents or as a family? Uh, currently in, in the core program, we don't accept any volunteers. Quiet, please. Uh, the reason being is uh, safety. Uh, we send our teams out, they're well-trained, um, and you never know what kind of situation you're going to encounter, so we don't, we don't accept volunteers currently. And I'll just add, that's also true for the homeless point in time count. Um, we can have young people volunteer to gather um, giveaways ahead of time, but we actually can't have young people out doing the surveys for the same reason, which is unfortunate, but... but Families are welcome at Trinity. <laughs> oh, um, if you want to help your um, young ones to um, not be afraid and to learn um, serve, how do a service project, you can let us know and we'll see what we can do. Supervision, adult supervision though, families only, not don't send us your kids. <laughs> Except for you, you can send your kids. <laughs> Can you talk about the needs for people with pets? How prevalent the issue is? Do shelters allow them? I can take we that already answered yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, there are no shelters that I know of in the county that take them. It's something that we're talking about. And we're working on an East County Care Center, um, which is going to be the brick and mortar drop in site. And part of the plans for that, when and if that happens, we're working on it, will involve having kennels so that people can at least have their pets safely secured outside. It's just a liability thing. This is the big, the big obstacle to having pets indoors, um, but where we're looking at having kennels outdoors. What is the strategy for dealing with people on the streets that would not be able to afford low cost housing? If a resident calls about such people, what are immediate short term and long term actions that can be provided? So the first thing that's going to happen is uh, our core teams are going to go out and engage the individual living where they're currently living. Um, we're going to offer to bring them into a care center such as uh, Trinity Center um, or one of the other care centers here in Contra Costa County. And we are going to connect them 
with people who can provide them with services um, and potentially get them into a shelter where we can start really building a case plan and developing um, some progress with their life. That's getting into the system so they can be, begin mm -hmm. those steps. There are very well defined steps and it does take time. And so, but it's important to get into the system. And I'll just add, there's different sort of funding streams for different kinds of rental support. Um, so they may qualify for Section 8, for example, and a caseworker can help them, you know, get to that. Maybe they just need short, time-limited rental support and services, and maybe they could get rapid rehousing. That's what that is. Or maybe they need permanent supportive housing, full-term voucher and services. But the care center staff in particular are really equipped to help sort of walk them through that path. Is there a definition difference between low income and affordable housing? Um, affordable housing um, is talking about a variety of types of affordable housing. So, so um, low income is defined as, as anybody who's earning less than 80% of area median income. But there's also very low income, which is 50% of area median income. And then there's also extremely low income, which is 30% of area median income and below. Um, and then on the ownership side, we, we, we um, oftentimes have what's called moderate um, income. And that's people with incomes that go up to 120% of area median income. And that's also considered affordable. So affordable housing is t could be talking about any of those. Um, any of those income categories. And in the state of California, pretty much up to 120% is sort of where affordable housing ends. Um, I will say I, I think that that's something that may change in the future because there is a growing, um, a growing gap of people who might even be up higher than 120% of area median income and still have, are, are having like a really high housing cost burden or have a hard time affording either rent or being able to purchase, um, but traditionally it's it's the, the highest would be 120, and that's and with rental it usually only goes up to 80. We've had a little bit of success with shared housing, not a lot because that's a, a roommate situation. And then if you remember what it was like to be a roommate, <laughs> it's difficult to find the one you can live with. Um, so, but we have had some success where someone has a house and they're older and they can't do the yard work or the upkeep or they're just lonely. So we recently enabled a, a young man who, um, you probably have seen at farmer's markets, he plays his guitar, he does house sitting and um, doesn't earn very much money and he now lives in one of those shared homes because the owner just needs somebody to play chess with once a week. So he's housed. And so it's an excellent, it doesn't fit everybody. It's just, and so that's what we have to do, is we have to be creative and we have to look for those, those nuances and those opportunities to say, well, maybe this will work. Does Walnut Creek permit untraditional rentals such as upgraded garages, in-law units, et cetera? Yes, that's actually one of the things that we're focusing on. They're called the accessory dwelling units. Uh, the council in the last six months has passed a enhanced ordinance and we're actually uh, there's more enhancements that are going to be coming down in the, the June time frame. This is one of the areas in which we, not only the, the state, but also uh, Walnut Creek is focusing on because we think that there is a huge advantage to providing more housing options to those individuals in the community, independent of whatever their, um, their pay scale is. Police have said they can't remove backpacks of homeless if they are left. What happened to see something, say something? I guess a, a backpack that's just left. Oh, an abandoned? Abandoned. Yeah. That's yeah. a good word for it. Yeah. Abandoned. Something that's abandoned, we can remove that. Uh, we, we store it for safekeeping. We can't dispose of it. Uh, we can't just throw it away, especially if it has personal belongings in it. But if it's left un abandoned, yeah, uh, call it in. Uh, see something, say something is absolutely true. Uh, comes down to safety, but uh, we can, you know, we can assess it, and if it's a danger, then we'll take care of it. But uh, we, uh, we know for a fact we can't throw those away, so uh, we do have to store it. So, what is your stance on the housing first model? How do you respond to residents who don't want more housing in Walnut Creek? I'll just clarify what housing first means. 
Um, so Housing First is actually a federal policy that essentially, if you have somebody that's homeless and you're working to get them into housing, you're not putting a bunch of roadblocks in the way. So you're not saying, well, I'll house you if you're clean and sober, or I'll house you when your income gets up to a certain level. You're not making people jump through a bunch of hoops to be housing ready. It basically means you're going to try and find the housing model that's going to work for them where they are, um, which is kind of separate from building or adding new units, just to clarify. And I think, you know, in terms of on the other side, if the, cons if the question is related to, um, you know, the development and the push from the state um, to be able to have more housing um, available and more housing constructed and how to balance that with communi the community members who don't want to have continued growth or have more housing. And it is a, it's a really hard balance. It's a challenge. And so what we really focus on is to kind of do, do the housing development in a smart way, really try to have the density and the increase in density in areas that are close to, um, like, like, like close to downtown, close to public transportation, close, close to BART, and, and be able to design um, the community in a really sort of smart and, and um, accommodating way to, to be able to have people to still be able to live um, in the way that they're accustomed to and know that we're also still working together to meet the housing needs and the housing crisis. And the state is passing a lot of laws that that will make it harder and harder for, for local cities and jurisdictions to be able to, to resist having growth in their community. Yeah. I'm from Palo Alto, yeah. so I can say this, don't be Palo Alto. They basically <laughs> blocked like everything. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. part of why the state laws are happening. Yeah. I just wanted to add to Housing First, the reason why the federal government is promoting Housing First is because there's a lot of data to show that once somebody is in housing, then they are much more likely to be able to stabilize their mental health and their physical health and their drug and alcohol problems. And if you, it's almost impossible for, you know, Michael's describing like, okay, so you're trying to get sober and the person next to you is so, is, is drunk and smells of alcohol. I am so, not drunk. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so she's drunk. I'm drunk. <laughs> you know, and it's important for her to have access to the shelter for her health and safety, but I'm like not going to be able to get sober, right? Getting somebody into stable housing is key to all the rest of that stuff stabilizing. That's, that's why we don't want to put a bunch of hurdles in front of people. The, the other thing I'll say in that Palo Alto is a very good example. There was a story that came out last year. You can make $250,000 oh, yeah. in Palo Alto and qualify for low income housing. Yep. And the, there's multiple reasons for that, but one of them is because we're not, as, commu as a community in general, not just Walnut Creek, but the broader community, we're not building enough housing units, whether that's for purchase or for rent. And that has drastic effects, right? Yep. I, I always tell the story when I moved to Walnut Creek in 1998 with my wife, I was right off of uh, right off the free freeway, and we rented a 680 square foot studio, and I was spending almost a thousand dollars. Today, that same unit goes for over two thousand dollars. So, people are spending, uh, you know, upwards forty, sometimes more of their income on yes. rent. Therefore, they can't afford to buy the housing. So, if any of you own your house and you want to sell it, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to have this constant turnover in the housing so that individuals have uh, housing options at, a, of course, uh, an affordable price. I mean, it, there's downstream effects by, by, by preventing development in, in our community. And uh, uh, that's why the City Council has devoted so much time and effort not only to low-income housing, but also development for, for, uh, for market uh, <coughs> housing units. We live in a residential area near the trails. We and other neighbors call the police about individuals who are mentally disturbed or drugged on, uh, in these areas. The police answers that we, there's nothing we can do. We have found on the trail uh, people hanging out all day behind bushes, behind the houses, etc. We don't feel safe, including my other neighbors. We don't like it. What can be changed? Depends on what kind of action you're anticipating is it an arrest situation um, you know that as a community um, if an officer says there's nothing we can do uh, there is always something we can do there is uh, trying to get them into a shelter if they're committing a crime yeah we can arrest uh, if you call us and you need our help we're, we're there to help you and uh, that should be something that you don't accept if it's something, uh, you know, if you're saying, hey, arrest the person, and we can't arrest them, they didn't violate a law, we're not going to arrest them. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. 
but maybe there's something we can do about the quality of life issue, which is probably 75% of the homeless issues that we deal with are quality of life issues. Um, being visible is not a crime. Being homeless is not a crime. Um, if they're on the trails and they're not doing anything illegal, we can't arrest them. We can't move them. We can ask for their uh, cooperation, and mo most times that they'll move. But, um, you know, if you're, if, it just depends on what the expectation is. Um, communicate clearly with the officer what, what your intent is. You know, what, what can you do? Ask the officer questions. Demand that. Uh, we, we're, here, you, you, we're here to serve you. Uh, demand those answers. Ask, so have that dialogue with the officers, and the officers are encouraged to have that dialogue with you. Um, it is your neighborhood. Um, it is kind of an eyesore. I ride my bike to work every single day, and I'm up and down those trails, and I see homeless people, and they're not doing anything wrong. Um, but uh, a part of dealing with crime in a community is dealing with the fear of crime. And if you're not feeling safe, then we need to address that. So it, if you, if you clear, clearly communicate with the officer who's out there, and if you're not getting the satisfaction that you need from the officer, then you can always talk to the on-duty supervisor. Say, on-duty supervisor, how can we, what can we do about this situation? And we'll find creative ways to deal with it. And uh, there was just case in point, there was an individual that was using a parking space downtown and using that to store his property. He would feed the meter, and he was basically renting this parking space. So that came to an <laughs> officer's attention, and we were kind of like scratching our heads saying, gosh, you know, we've never really encountered that. It's a pretty creative way to uh, use a parking stall. So we really had to dig deep about, um, is this a violation? Um, it came down to exploring our municipal code. It came down to exploring our vehicle code. and. Um, Again, the networking part of this is working with other city departments, and so we actually found a code that was a violation in our code enforcement. Our code enforcement officer helped us out with that, and it's just that constant communication. So now we know, yeah, it's illegal, and we can cite the person for it. So um, it's just those kind of approaches that if the officer and the department is willing to um, dig in and go the extra mile to, to serve you, then uh, we're going to find a way to, to serve you. Um, but please, again, um, don't accept that answer. And um, if you don't like the answer from the officer, then ask for the on-duty supervisor. And then that's where I come in or a sergeant will come in and um, we'll deal with it. So the officers out there, they deal with a lot of dis different situations. They may not have all the answers for everything. We have a lot of new officers too. So um, part of my job and part of our sergeant's job is to educate our officers so they can help you out and you won't get those responses from the officers. So, In the very rare circumstance where our officers are not able to help you, uh, the city council is very interested in receiving that feedback. All of our information is posted online. My cell phone number is posted online. So if you, uh, if you ever have any concerns and uh, you, you, you feel like you're hitting a brick wall, I haven't run into one of those situations, but if you do, please feel free to reach out to me, email me, it's merat-creek.org, or reach out to one of your other city council members. Again, we're very interested and sensitive to hearing this type of information from the community. Yeah, I mean, we can't violate anybody's civil rights, and if it is something where we're asking them to move on and they don't move on, we can't force them. Um, it is a tough situation for officers, and it's always a hurdle for us to have to deal with that. Um, but um, it is protecting their rights, it's protecting your rights, and we have to be very careful to, to um, be sensitive to both of those sides. We have time for two more here. The speaker from the city cited that 50% of the homeless come from Walnut Creek and Concord and then concluded, so they're all from here. Where are the other 50% coming from? They're, com they're all coming from local areas here in the community. Um, I think one was from San Francisco County. The rest of them were from Contra Costa County and all local. And I can add, so on our point in time count last year, which again is not like the full picture, but at least a snapshot, 80% of people that we surveyed were from Contra Costa. And most of those folks did lose their housing in the community in which they were living. I don't know that proportion, but like of all the people we surveyed, 80% were from Contra Costa. Um, the rest were Alameda, San Francisco, and then a few from like far reaching, but really 80% were from here, with the county. And the final card here is, can we bring the homeless staying at the armory to speak to us directly to be part of this panel? Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. Bring the homeless. 
the, the people who were members part. from the commu homeless community could they participate on this panel? Yes. It could be um, another forum. I think one of the things that um, we try really hard not to do is to put people who are living without housing and who are having a tough time on display. Mm -hmm. And we can try to be well-meaning. I'm very protective when the news media wants to come to Trinity. Um, I want to be right there to make sure they're not in someone's face with a camera that doesn't want to be. Some of our members are very private. Their families don't know they're homeless, mostly the older women. I've not told their children. And so um, they don't want their faces, and they don't really want to be in front of a forum. But we could always ask if it were a, a, maybe a smaller round table, more intimate. And you can always come to Trinity. If you want to get to know folks, come down and have lunch with us. We have lunch every day of the week except for the weekend, M Monday through Friday. We have lunch. And you can come and you can grab a meal and sit down and get to know people. And um, believe me, it's a wonderful thing to do because if, if you are homeless, people avoid you. They don't want to look at you. They want to sit next to you. They don't want to talk to you. And so it's a very lonely existence. And so, yes, they congregate in camps. And sometimes then there's negative activity happening there. So we try to provide a more positive environment. It, it, it can be a struggle because when you get a lot of people in community, it's just like a big family. Arguments break out. And so mom and dad have to step in. But I, I encourage you to come. And um, we are, you have a representative of um, Creek Kids Care here. Their children from uh, Las Lomas and Wanda Creek. Creek. They come all the time. And they do projects, art projects. They do Christmas angel projects. They do parties. They um, make cookies. I hope we can still do that yeah, right. with the health thing. <laughs> and. It, make signs and cards for people. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It's the family that they don't have. So I would, I would suggest that rather than a, a forum and having them feel. It's hard for me to be up here. <laughs> so, um, And this crowd has been very nice. Yes. It's not always nice. Yeah. And I'm always mindful about not wanting to put people in a, on a target. In a target. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming thank tonight you. to talk about this important topic. Good night.